Community's the name and culture's my game. I love to study how society works. And right now I'm feeling very social. Let's take a tour around here and see who we meet. Many flags have flown over the historic town of Newcastle. The city was founded by the Dutch, captured by the Swedes, and eventually fell under British control. During the Revolutionary War, the town sided with the colonies, and Newcastle became the first capital of Delaware. This unusual building is the Old Library Museum. A series of skylights and light sinks brighten up the interior and even the basement level. I guess you could say this museum really sheds light on some works of art. I'm just burning to tell you about this building, the Emanuel Church and Tower, built in the late 1600s. Unfortunately, a recent fire burned down everything but the walls, which were then used to reconstruct the building we see today. This Dutch treat is the Dutch House Museum. It was built in 1707 and represents a fine example of Dutch colonial style. The building has been well preserved, hardly changing a bit in nearly 300 years. Talk about being set in your ways. Over here you can see the old arsenal, which was built in 1809. The arsenal served as an ammunition storehouse during the War of 1812, but now it's a restaurant. Hmm, a history ranging from gunpowder to gourmet cuisine. Now there's food for thought. So long. Let's talk again soon. I hope you've got your passport handy, because we're going on a tour of Ellis Island and New York City! Take a look at Ellis Island, the gateway to America. During the early part of this century, up to five Thousand people a day pass through Ellis Island. Today, the island is a museum honoring the thousands of immigrants who helped shape the United States into the marvelous mixture of cultures we find today. Nestled among those buildings over there is Wall Street, the financial capital of the nation. Named for an earthen wall built by Dutch settlers centuries ago, Wall Street is now the home of the famous New York Stock Exchange and many leading financial firms. I hope that raises your interest. These skyscrapers are the twin towers of the World Trade Center, a focal point of international business. The towers stand among the tallest in the world. Each skyscraper has thousands of windows, 104 elevators, and lots and lots of business people. The perfect place for a socialite like me. Manhattan may have been the best bargain in world history. Dutch colonists purchased the island from native Indians in 1626 for about $24 worth of silver trinkets. Hmm, I think the rent has gone up since then. Do you know what this is? 
Okay, I won't leave you in suspense. It's the Brooklyn Bridge, one of the longest suspension bridges in the world. It spans the East River and connects Brooklyn to the island of Manhattan. If anyone tries to sell it to you, just ignore them. It's not really for sale. This magnificent copper monument is the Statue of Liberty, completed in 1886. The 151-foot-tall statue was the first object sighted by many immigrants sailing in from Europe. Lady Liberty herself is an immigrant. The statue was a gift from France, commemorating the long friendship between France and the United States. So long! Let's talk again soon. Let's go undercover. Under a covered bridge, that is, in West Arlington, Vermont. Here's one of Vermont's charming covered bridges. Vermont's economy was a bit slow in the early 1900s, so the state took its time replacing the old wooden covered bridges with newer metal models. Locals eventually recognized the historic value and the tourism appeal of these rustic bridges and started preserving them before they were all gone. building is the Inn at the Covered Bridge. It was built as a tavern in 1792, and its front yard was used as a practice field by Revolutionary War hero Ethan Allen. Later, it served as the home for another type of American hero, artist Norman Rockwell. How's that for some inside information? Dairy farms like this one are important to Vermont. The state produces millions of gallons of milk every year. That fills a lot of cereal bowls. It also makes for a lot of ice cream. Just ask a certain Vermont ice cream company famous for its wacky flavors. Hmm, this may sound sappy, but I dearly love maple syrup. In the spring, Vermonters tap maple trees for their sap, which is boiled down to a sugary liquid. Isn't that sweet? White frame churches like this one are typical in the small towns of Vermont. You can usually find them on the main street, also called the Village Green. Their rural charm and elegance may make other buildings, well, uh, green with envy. So long! Let's talk again soon! Kentucky Derby. Kentucky is nicknamed the Bluegrass State after the grass that grows abundantly here. No, the grass itself isn't blue, but it does bloom with tiny blue flowers. Horses eat grass, and bluegrass grows in turf rich with calcium and lime, giving horses strong bones and muscles. That's why Kentucky ranks first in the breeding of thoroughbred horses. But I wonder who has to mow the lawn. The original grandstand was here on the east side of the track, which meant that spectators had to look right into the setting sun to see the race. 
Hmm, I wonder if that's what they mean by blinding speed. Anyway, it finally dawned on the owners to move stands to the opposite side, where they are now. You're looking at Churchill Downs, home of the world-famous Kentucky Derby. Churchill Downs was founded in 1875, and the Derby has been run here every year since. This place is so much fun, wild horses couldn't drag me away! The Kentucky Derby is the oldest continuously run racing event in the nation. Horse racing fans call it the greatest two minutes in sports and the run for the roses. Three-year-old thoroughbreds race one and a quarter miles from start to finish. Ooh, I'd hate to run that far carrying someone on my back. Let me make a couple of points about the twin spires. These classic spires were built in 1895 and became the instant symbol of the Derby. The two steeples rise 120 feet into the blue Kentucky sky. That's about 12 stories high. It's quite an inspiring sight. So long. Let's talk again soon. There's nothing like a little southern exposure. Let's take a tour of Atlanta, Georgia. During the Civil War, General William Tecumseh Sherman marched through Georgia. After many fierce battles with the Confederate Army, he captured Atlanta. And before continuing on his famous march to the sea, the Union General burned most of the city to the ground. It must have been quite a sight. Atlanta grew around the railroads and used to be called Terminus because it sits at the center of several railways. The city was heavily damaged during the Civil War, but that wasn't the end of the line. Atlanta eventually regrew and became a symbol of the reunion between North and South. This is Swan House. I promise you won't find any ugly ducklings here. It was built by Edward Inman, heir to a pre-Civil War cotton fortune, who also cottoned to beautiful buildings. Inside Swan House, you can see the original furnishings. Although built in 1928, the mansion is a perfect example of antebellum architecture and interior decoration. So long! Let's talk again soon! Come on! Let's hit the slopes of Aspen, Colorado! Modern sculptures like this one reveal that the people of Aspen really like to branch out into the arts. With a jazz festival, film festival, art museum, and dance group, Aspen is a center of high culture in the lofty Rocky Mountains. This 
is Wheeler Block, named after a wealthy investor who helped Aspen reach its peak. Although silver mining was the first industry in this town, you could say later residents struck gold when they turned Aspen into a premier ski resort. In Aspen, outdoor activities don't dribble away when the snow melts. During the summer, these mountains are perfect for hiking, biking, whatever's to your liking. You can have a ball playing golf, or if tennis is your racket, you'll find that here too. Over here, you can see the Ute City Bank, once the headquarters of Mr. H.P. Cowenhoven, one of the area's first silver prospectors. In the late 1800s, Aspen was just one of several mining boom towns. But with two railroads, rich silver mines, and even richer investors, Aspen prospered while its neighbors faded into ghost towns. That's Aspen Mountain, where the area's first ski resort opened. The area's economy would have faced an uphill climb if investors hadn't recognized Aspen's perfect ski conditions and opened the world's longest ski lift here in the 1940s. Since then, the city has grown faster than a downhill ski run. Aspen was founded near the summer hunting grounds of the Ute Indians. In fact, people originally called the town Ute City, but it was Uteless. <laughs> the name didn't stick. More people rooted for a connection to the beautiful local trees, and Aspen became the official city name. So long! Let's talk again soon. I can tell you all about Las Vegas. Centuries ago, Spanish explorers blazed the old Spanish trail under a blazing desert sun and camped in a cooler area they called Las Vegas, or the Meadows. Later, Las Vegas became a railroad town. When gambling became legal, the sound of the slot machines replaced the screech of the train whistle. Today, Las Vegas is one of the fastest growing cities in the nation. Las Vegas has always been a hot spot, literally. It's built in the hottest, driest part of the nation. If it weren't for nearby Hoover Dam, which provides both water and hydroelectric power, the city would dry up faster than a gambler's bank account. Neon signs make Vegas look modern, but people have lived in the area for 20,000 years. People called basket makers wove their way through the area long ago, and Paiute Indians have called Nevada home for ages. Of course, so has entertainer Wayne Newton. This is the famous Las Vegas Strip, one of the bright spots in Nevada. Neon signs and electronic billboards point the way to gambling casinos and extravagant hotels that look like Roman forums, Egyptian pyramids, and even a mini replica of New York City. All out here in the middle of the desert. So long! Let's talk again soon. Forgive me while I prattle on about Seattle. Awnings like these are common in Seattle, where rain clouds are a familiar sight. 
Moist air blows in from the nearby Pacific Ocean, frequently showering rain on the city. The rainy season can sometimes last for ten months out of the year. Now, where did I put my umbrella? Here's Pike's Place Market. You'll find a whole community of farmers, fishermen, and craftspeople ready to sell you handmade jewelry, fresh seafood, and loads and loads of fine produce. Hmm, I hope you like broccoli. Seattle, Washington is home to the world-famous Space Needle, a 600-foot high tower that was built for the 1962 World Fair by architects who had a point to make. If alternative music strikes a chord with you, you'll love Seattle, the home of the grunge movement and the starting point for many popular rock music groups. I just wish they'd learn to dress a little better. So long! Let's talk again soon.